All right, so now this is more of a, we are going to open the hood of the AI, what that use case, what Jeff was describing. We'll probably use that as, a, as some sort of a preface uh, and I'll keep coming back to that use case and, and see how we can correlate with what's happening under the hood. Cool, you up with me? You don't need any caffeine. I think some of this is gonna wake you up. <laughs> All right, so what? is this AI. There are many things within AI. AI has been done for many, many decades. We all know that if you if you are new to AI, uh, just remember it's been done for many decades. But the way it was done is what we call the rule-based AI, right? Where you have some rules engine, you define that rule, and those rules are taking care of uh, your functionality. So you say, okay, do this only, and uh, rest would be ignored. So. Uh, AI will say, okay, I'm, I'm only doing what you're asking me to do, but for that, you need to plan, you need to have an expert system and many other things. That changed when when we sort of started getting into uh, statistical-based uh, learning. So learn machine learning itself uh, based on the previous data. And that is how uh, we got into many mechanics. What we know today is one is called classification where uh, we say, okay, this is good, this is bad, this is dog, this is cat, right? So that is how the classification would done. And uh, when, when we are looking at, for example, Avinash, you asked about the fraud detection. Uh, in that scenario, that fraud detection is actually looking at uh, a set of examples and saying, okay, these are all good, but one is outlier. That means it is bad. And I'm going to flag that and I'm gonna send an alert to the user that, hey, you spent $425 in, in, in Alibaba somewhere. Is it correct? Right, so that's that's more on the classification problem. Then the, the, the problem statement came around is a clustering. That, okay, how we can uh, sort of create a cluster of data. And then based on that, we sort of uh, create a chunk. Maybe a home price range of uh, 250 to 500K is a one, or a zip code of uh, a five uh, combination of cities, maybe is another cluster, maybe a, a completely different set of clustering problem we might be solving in terms of uh, the, the demographics that, okay, user from 20 to 30 is one user base versus 40 to 50 is another user base and whatnot, right? So that's a clustering problem uh, been solved for many decades uh, in the machine learning, uh, or at least for, for past decade to two decades. In, in machine learning world. Reinforcement has been done many for many years into what we call the automation. Uh, and uh, what we see in the autonomous driving, we saw what we saw on uh, Tesla, that uh, autopilot, or any ADAS system, what you are used to, if you don't own Tesla, but you may have your car, which has a automated drive assistant system. Uh, that is done through reinforcement learning. Uh, the way to think about reinforcement learning is uh, keep feeding the right thing to the model. Uh, it's similar to what we were talking about chat GPT, where uh, based on a human is sending that feedback saying that this is right and this is wrong. And that is what the reinforcement learning is. And the recent trend, what you see here today is uh, generative AI where we are literally creating things out of thin air, <laughs> not really thin air, but using the existing data, we are creating new data. Using the existing uh, text, we are creating something new, a creative way of uh, working along. So when we are looking at a traditional way of doing things, right? when we say traditional way, pre chat GPT era, uh, by all means, uh, and again, it doesn't mean that chat GPT was the time or was the place where uh, generative AI started. Generative AI started way before that. But chat GPT is like an iPhone moment, right? Probably nobody knew what smartphone is until iPhone came. Okay, sorry for Android fans. Uh, but coming back to the task-specific AI model, uh, it's, it's a single model done for a single functionality. So uh, language translation could be one thing. And it's done only using that single model. That model is not able to do anything other than translating that English to Spanish or Spanish to English and, and so forth. Uh, in the manufacturing world, I think a question was asked that what use cases you may have. 
is coming down to that image recognition where uh, you have a manufacturing plant, you have a lot of things you are manufacturing. Let's say phone is one of the things you are manufacturing and uh, you want to validate whether this phone has a scratch or not as a part of quality control. And based on that image being captured from the camera, which is somewhere in your plant, it's capturing that image. And then based on that, it's identifying whether this phone or this device has a scratch or not. Uh, that is extreme uh, from a quality control point of view, but image recognition could also work in the favor of uh, uh, you throw a picture uh, which has 10 different objects and it identifying within that picture, you have a car, you have a tire, you have a human, you have a, a, a post, you have a stop sign. And again, going back to that Tesla autopilot, it's doing a lot of image recognition, right? We spoke about Alexa, which is a speech to text, text to speech, uh, sentiment analysis or tax extraction is heavily used into the financial domain. And we'll get to that in, in, uh, in the probably one of the use cases when we are described. But the traditional way of doing AI, it requires not only this kind of a bespoke model, that means this is a task specific model. It also required a lot of prep work. When I say prep work, it required a lot of data cleaning or cleansing you need to go through an entire ETL pipeline or ETL pipeline is extract, transform and load. So sort of your data is uh, in a very raw format, but model algorithms would not understand those raw format. So you need to change that to, to make it compatible with your model algorithm. So that means you need to transform or change the data. You need to also label the data saying that, hey, this is good, this is bad. This is Spanish, this is English. This is in a, in a text, this is in a speech. This is uh, from a sentiment point of view. Maybe this is a positive sentiment, this is a negative sentiment. So we need to sort of create tons of data labels and then feed to the algorithms. And then algorithm will learn based on the data, right? So that is a, a sort of a, uh, a generic or rather a legacy way, if I, if I use that term, a legacy way of doing AI. Now, what changed is the foundation models. And some of you may have heard a term called LLMs or large language models, but I'm going to use the word foundation model uh, for the sake of uh, brevity because LLMs uh, or large language models is only meant for text. And then there is image model. And then there is a video model but all encompassing kind of uh, derived as a foundation model. 